Hello and welcome back to Wild World. It's episode four and this week has been National Hedgehog Awareness Week. Sadly, across the UK over the past two decades, we've lost around 50% of our hedgehogs. But the good news, hedgehogs love gardens and while we're all in lockdown, there is something that we can all do to improve our gardens to make them better habitats for hedgehogs. Cornwall Wildlife Trust have got some great advice on their website, so I'll put the link in the comments of the video, so definitely check it out and see what you can do. But for now, we're gonna to head to Somerset, where Robbie is there with the Wild Beehive. Welcome back to the hive here in Somerset. Now, I said in my last video that I would try and take the bottom hatch off the hive this time, so we could have a look inside and see what the bees are up to. So, we're going in. Now I do have to be a little bit careful when doing this because there are guard bees whose job it is to look out for anything they think might threaten the hive. And I'm pretty sure if I was a bee and I saw this coming towards me, I'd think it was a threat. Wow, so these guys have been really busy. So you can see that lovely white wax, those little hexagonal comb cells that they've been adding to the bottom of last year's combs. So they're much bigger than they were last year. Now those little wax cells are really important for the bees. It's where the queen lays her eggs, so the little grubs will develop inside one of those wax cells. And it's also obviously where the bees store their honey. So how exactly do bees make honey? And we saw in the last video, the bees were out collecting nectar from flowers. That nectar goes down into their honey stomach where enzymes will actually transform the raw nectar sugars into glucose and fructose, which is basically what honey is made of. So they bring that back to the hive, they regurgitate it, pass it between several bees so more enzymes can work on it. They then deposit it into the wax cells that you can see here, and then they'll cap it off with another layer of wax. And that's basically the bees' food store. They can use that through the winter when there are no flowers around and it will last a really, really long time. Some of the oldest honey ever found was in Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt, and that was still perfectly edible even after 3,000 years. Well, I don't want to disturb them too much, so I'm gonna put the hatch back on and leave them to it. Alongside our honeybees, we also have over 200 species of solitary bee, and they are incredibly important for pollination. And amazingly, there is something that we can do to help them, and Sophie Pavel is here to show us how. Hello, and welcome back to the garden where we're here for another session of Nature DIY. So, we're gonna be making a bee hotel, or an Airbnb, if you will for a solitary bee to try and attract them to our garden and make some attractive nest space for them. You will need a pot of some sort. This is gonna form the structure of the nest. If you don't have that, you could just recycle some old jam jars or some plastic, basically weatherproof containers. Then you'll need ideally some bamboo. You could recycle some old toilet roll paper holders and these quite easily go in your containers and then you could stuff them with natural material. Finally, you just want a nice mixture of some leaf litter, maybe some grass cuttings, anything that's nice natural material which will basically make a good nest. Okay, so I'm gonna start by using this pot. Um, I've actually very helpfully cut the bamboo the same height as the pot itself. Okay, so what I'm gonna do with my pot is I'm going to line the bottom with a bit of my natural nest material like that. Then I'm just gonna start arranging my bamboo sticks all the way around in a kind of funky circle. So essentially the female solitary bee is gonna see this hole and think, oh, I'm gonna lay my egg in there. And then depending on what species of bee she is, she'll cap it at the end to basically seal it until the larva is ready to emerge. We want the holes to be nice and visible so that the female bees looking to start nesting um, don't have to waste loads of time searching them out, but also a little bit protected. Okay, I think that is essentially a bee hotel. Okay, so that literally took like five minutes. Um, super quick, super easy. In my opinion, the messier the better. 
So wildlife doesn't care about neatness, it doesn't care about an orderly, tidy garden. So I think it's time to find a nice sunny spot facing south to put our bee hotel in. It's really important that it's south facing because insects gravitate towards warm, dry areas, especially when they're nesting. So often we go on about bumbles and honeys, but it's the bees like the carpenters, the masons and the leaf cutters which are responsible for securing 30% of our food. So basically, if you're going to spend 15 minutes doing anything at the moment, why don't you get outside, do something for nature, get out of your head for a few minutes and um, yeah, it really, really works. Please do send in any pictures of your bee hotels or Airbnbs, it would be amazing to see them. And it really does take so little time to make a really big difference. And now it's time for our weekly birdsong lesson with the lovely Lucy. Hello, welcome back to another mini lesson on identifying birds by their song. Today the songster we're going to meet is a very, very common bird. It's what we call a generalist, so it survives just about anywhere. And if you've got feeders in your garden, you'll certainly be familiar with him. He's a big fan of suet and seed. It is the great tit with that shiny black cap and yellow chest with that bold black stripe down the middle. Now the great tit, when he's behaving, has a really iconic and distinct song. And I say when he's behaving because this little bird is notorious for making all manner of noises under the sun. His true song is very identifiable and it's made up of just two syllables. To remember it, all you've got to think of is one word and that is teacher. So when he starts singing, it's this uneven bounce and he sounds like he's saying, teacher, teacher, teacher. If that doesn't stick, another way of remembering is to imagine blowing up a squeaky airbed. It's that squeaky bouncy noise you've got to listen out for. Now at this time of year, there is another two syllable songster knocking around and that is a little brown job that's returned all the way from Africa where it spent the winter. It is the Chiff Chaff. And with the Chiff Chaff, his name spells out his song. Now rather than that uneven bounce, the teacher, teacher, it's more of an evenly spaced tick tock like a clock. So tick, Talk. And you can compare it side by side to that great tit just to get those differences. So hopefully now you can pick out the great tit by song. It's a really, really lovely bird to listen to and a very easy one to start off with. And now we're heading up to Cheshire where wildlife cameraman Ben Harris is on the search for a bird that has caught his eye. Knowing your local patch really well is a great way to see more interesting wildlife and wildlife behaviours. And after seeing the buzzard last week, I was inspired to see another really big British bird species. And so I've come down to this little patch of water at the back of the house to see if I can't find some swans to film. And uh, it's exactly the right time of year for them to be nesting, so we might get to see something special. The first thing that popped into mind when I thought about filming swans for this was how aggressive they are. But I actually think this is part of what makes them such great photographic and filming subjects because they're so confident around people and will just hang around you while you set up your camera and move around and they don't really get scared that easily, which is great. It's no joke when an animal with a two metre wingspan is eye level with you and coming straight towards you. So best to back off and give them their space because we don't want them to get agitated because the wildlife always comes first. The other great thing is that they're so big, so it's easy to fill your frame and get the nice little detail shots. They also look great in the British landscape because they belong here, right? So super wides do really well as well. And trying to complement these two things, the really wide and the really tight shots, is a great way of building a little sequence out for yourself. Now I know that these aren't the only two swans on this lake, so I'm going to go and take a peek and see if I can't find the other pair. Swans will build their nests in the shallow areas of the body of water that they live on. So by following the edge of the lake, I just have to keep looking for those iconic white feathers and see if this other pair are nesting. As I was walking along, I kept my eyes on the reeds and I saw this little flash of white. And we have got a nesting swan just over there, not 10 meters from the path. Um, she's, she's sleeping right now, she doesn't really notice that I'm here. So I'm gonna get a few shots and then
Mum will usually sit on the nest for about a month and she is the one who does most of the incubating and rotating the eggs and cleaning the nest area. Whereas dad brings the food and nest repair items and defends the area. As I've just found out, I'm not sure when the eggs will hatch. So I'm going to come back again in a few nights to see what's going on. Even though we didn't get any signets today with mum still on the nest, it was still great to get out and see the local wildlife. As I've been forced to slow down slightly anyway, it's good to practice this elsewhere too. Just five or ten minutes sat still somewhere will let you connect to nature in a way that doesn't really happen when you're constantly on the go. As always, thank you so much for sending in your pictures and clips. It's amazing to see what you're discovering on your doorsteps. As the images and footage continue to come in, it seems that we are all that much more connected with our own local patch. And hopefully this might be something that we can carry forward, whatever the near future might hold.